Hello everyone. Welcome to Kumi Cha Cha. Waiting for Grace to join us. Oopsie. No right to the music in the background. This is from a collection from the African Classics playlist on uh, Tujipange Africa Media. Uh, <laughs> so, just waiting to great shows out. His name is Wafula. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I am fine. I'm doing well with the uh, my friend in the background. Hi, Wafula. <laughs> Wafula is deciding to join us for this shot. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> great. This cat, he was like, oh, he was likes to appear on every show. He likes attention. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, Wafula is welcome to the evening show. Yes, welcome. We are pet lovers. Yes, I'm um, Grace. I'm wondering if you can hear me well. I have music playing. Like I said, we have no copyright to it. Uh, yeah. I'm playing it in the background. Oliver and Tukuzi, one of the mm -hmm. one of the popular songs that I remember KBC they would always play. Um. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> okay. So Grace, how um. are you? Welcome. Every okay, first of all, Grace, we can't start the show without properly inviting and introducing ourselves. Hello, yes. everyone. And Kume Chacha. Kume chacha. Kume chacha. Kume chacha, Grace. Kume chacha kile de Philadelphia. Sijui huko kukoje? Ah, kume chacha Denver. Kume chacha Denver kweli. Nasikia <laughs> kuna nyesha mko na barafu kali. Kulikuwa na barafu. Sijui barafu is ice. I don't know what snow is in in Kiswahili but I don't know but you had snow? Yes, it snowed a lot on Thursday, but uh, what I'm realizing about Denver weather is uh it snows one day and then the sun shines so bright. And in a few hours, the snow has already disappeared. So we had like uh, 30 degrees on Thursday, which is close to freezing, if not. And then the next day, it was just like a summer day. Hmm? Wow. <laughs> yes, but welcome, everyone. Welcome to the show, Karibu Diaspora. For people who are watching from the U.S., for people who I don't know who's up right now in Kenya or like the, the European or the Asian time zones, Kumechacha. Um, gotcha. people across all states i'm in denver colorado grace is in the east coast in philadelphia pennsylvania yeah some of some of you are watching everywhere in between uh thank you for joining us for those who are watching now and for those who will come upon this show and watch it later thank you yeah so welcome everybody to kume church it is a sunday evening it has been pretty cold mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. So one of the important things we always say, take care of yourself. Fashion is great, but your health is better. So this is the time to start dressing warmly, pulling up some uh, fall clothes and pre-winter clothes from your closet mm -hmm. and just keeping yourself safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can still be smart and warm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. So then I think the uh, this is the season for people in the northern hemisphere to experience winter. But also remember, for some uh, people in other countries, this is when uh, summer is beginning for them. I know in Kenya right now, that's uh, the transition to summer. The heat season is probably starting. So send some heat when you can. People who are in the different time zones, help us out here. <laughs> yeah, Grace, I was also uh, reminded at work that this is the se- season for the flus, the, all, the, all kinds of flu. So this is the time to get your flu shot. The issue mm-hmm. of the flu shot has been very controversial. So some people uh, do not do flus, uh, do not do flu shots at all. But what? I have to take flu shots because of the nature of my work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They say they are anti-vaccine, maybe people. Yes. Okay. A lot of rumors and conspiracy around vaccinations and vaccines. But the doctors uh, should be able to empower us by educating us more about flu vaccines. So I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to one of the uh, podcasts or Facebook lives, you know, mm-hmm. with the proper information to come up and tell us about the um, the cause and prones of the flu. Yeah. So Grace, let's and, and, and let's that we not, should really take yeah. the flu shots. Yeah. Let's yeah. not dive into so much details because I know people are watching us and wondering what are these people talking about. Going to talk about today. Yes. So that's great. Uh, in the uh, the um, what's it called? The description in this video talks about our twenties. And, uh, yeah. we, you know, it's interesting for us when we were sitting and reflecting around happy times, sad times, interesting times. The 20s is one, one was one of those for us. And so stay tuned because I am going, Grace, I'm actually turning uh, 30 in uh, less than, not, slightly more than uh, uh, a month. And wow. So it's been a point of great reflection for me. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> I think I was there about 30 years ago or 25 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, it'd be pretty. I'm really uh, curious around what lessons I learned or looking back and thinking about if I'm turning into my, going into my 30s, what does that mean? What lessons can I learn? And what similarities are there? Because you said you, for you, it's been decades, but for me, it's just going, it's not even here yet. So that is true. But Grace, before we do all that, we always talk about self-care. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested in knowing what you did for self-care this weekend and as we start the new week. <laughs> so, Emily, thank you for joining us. You look beautiful as well. Grace, I, I decided to do this. So, for self-care this morning, I learned how to make American pancakes. See, not the, the ones that, uh, those nice ones that look like, taste like crepes. When I was in Kenya, my mom always made the crepes, which are more the thinner, tasty pancake. But I decided mm-hmm. to challenge myself and figure out how, if you go to places like IHOP or these American pancake places, the pancake is usually this thick. So, <laughs> Aki Grace, how can you show me the pancake when I'm drinking strungi? Like pure strungi with, with no escortables. So, <laughs> it there, me, I'm eating the bread for you. Don't worry. And they're so fluffy, you can see them break apart. It looks like um, cake. So I'm, okay. I've been really excited doing that. Is uh, for some people, cake. That looks like chapat cake. It looks like chapat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like therapy. So I was really happy to do it. Happy to learn a new skill. What yes. about you? What did you do for self care this week? Oh my goodness, Grace! This week, this weekend, especially <clears throat> my self care. I did a lewd. What does that mean? What's that? Eh, Grace, you do not know a lewd. No, a lewd. A lute. What is that? A lute. Everybody did a lute. A lute keep choke a keino. Ah! Am I lute? <laughs> Grace, uh, if you, you do know. not know a lute, you are in another <laughs> world altogether. A lute. You went and confused me. You went and confused me, Oada. <laughs> yes. A lute. Yes. Our brother, a lute. A lute. A lute. You're so right. It's a ce- celebrating a big, big, big achievement. I saw Kenya, yes. similar, even it was bigger than uh, Kenya Airways having their flight, direct flights coming from New York. Everyone was showing up. Everyone showed up from everywhere. You know, you very saw... nostalgic, very right. patriotic, very inspiring. I think I've watched that video. I'm ashamed, not ashamed to say, but I'm proud to say almost 10 times. Really? Yeah. That <laughs> self care has been great. It yeah. said no. No man is limited or something like that. Yeah, no human is limited. Yeah. No human is limited. Hmm. Yeah. So I have done a lot of limiteds. I have limited my sleep. 
I have slept like no ma like no sleep is limited. <laughs> I have eaten today like no food is limited. <laughs> Limited, <laughs> I have done a lot of limited, limited for a little for a little. Yeah. So oh. that was, uh, it was very inspiring that a, a world marathon owner set his own pace, set his own record. And Grace, the newest uh, motivating word for me, the newest self care word for me in town is pace setters. Pace setters. That's the latest word in town. Who are your pace setters? Who are the people who push you through your success and let you step aside and shine? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, last week we were posting around a similar thing about uh, li women lifting each other's crowns, mm -hmm. and it's almost the same concept, not at that advanced level, but almost the same concept. Do mm -hmm. you hang around people who help you push your ambition or your dreams and then step aside, or do you hang around people who help you through your dreams, steal it, and run away with it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my self care this week. Oh, that's yeah. nice. That's really nice. You are saying Elliot. I'm like, I. What are you saying? You are changa. Not yet. You know, we have Elliot biscuit. <laughs> we have Elliot bread, and then we have Elliot. Our very own Elliot. <laughs> that Elliot ran, my friend. He ran. He ran if running, <laughs> ah, he ran. He ran. Yes, and mm -hmm. also to mention the uh, the two women. I think uh, the, the marathons that happened this weekend. They are two mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. who not only came fast in the races but also broke an existing world record so you know kenya the kenyan the kenyan um, reputation the diaspora everyone thinks that you know kenyans are runners this is a good thing a good stereotype i don't know about you grace if everyone when you come grace, and ask you will, you are, a, are you a runner will you say yes will you say no i am a runner i'm a short distance runner but mostly i'm a national high jumper i can jump over high hall high walls i won the national uh, championship for that Oh, that's good. I don't think I can do it at my age now, but I used to be a national uh, championship brother. Yeah. But there's this stereotype that have, that we talk about in Kenya, about people from the Rift Valley, that when you go there, everybody's running in every direction because they want to make it to the world championship. <laughs> so I had an uncle who did not like running in school. And when they were made to run, he dropped out of school. He said, oh, I don't. why should I run? And nobody's chasing me. But running is the new child, new, the new talk of town. Yeah, yeah. Maybe one day we'll talk about coming and seeing people running, not to run away from things, but actually running to exercise. <laughs> and how? Yeah, but Grace, this. <laughs> yeah, this really places Kenya at a great place in history. There are times when our government has failed us, our country has failed us, but then you have this one or two people, one person who comes out and you know shapes things. Because if they say in history that one person changes things, you don't have to be a group, you don't have to be a crowd to make history. It's normally a, an individual sacrifice of one person that mm -hmm. changes the whole history. Mm -hmm. So this person, we celebrate him today because he made a difference. And to all our other athletes and every single person, every mom in the kitchen making pancakes and chapatis and everybody making that special sacrifice, keeping that extra hour, you know, awake to make a difference for their families. We all celebrate you. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Grace, let's come back around and get into the topic. Uh, for those yeah, who are yeah. joining, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we want to talk about like a fun and light topic, but also introspective topic. And uh, Grace, it's about our 20s. Um, as I said before, I'm about to turn 30. Um, there's a lot of life changes, life decisions that hap happen around this time. But Grace, when we started talking mm -hmm. about this topic, I became really fascinated with how you lived your 20s and ways oh, in I love it. maybe there's some similarities. I don't know about you, you know, what the, what the things you got up to before, <laughs> things you can admit yeah. to or not, because, you know, the 20s. Oh, my goodness, my 20s. We did wonders. <laughs> we did wonders. We did wonders. Huh. But I just yeah. looking back at life suddenly and realizing that time has really passed. And now we are speaking of retirement. Some people are speaking of buying their second, third, fourth car. Some people are thinking of buying homes, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, you look back in our 20s, what exactly were we doing? Because some of us cannot buy homes right now. We cannot afford even to pay rent. We cannot even yeah. afford to go on vacation. And they blame us that we do not do anything to save money. or We, do not, we just wasted our 20s away. Some, some of us in our 50s or mid 60s are looking for husbands or looking for wives and everybody's like what did you do in your 20s and that's why this topic came up like what did i do in my 20s yeah so 20s yeah. found me in college where did 20s find you 20s found me in college i started mm -hmm. college i started university 
um, when I was about to turn 19. So um, I started university here in the U.S. in September, I believe, or August or something. 19. Yeah, I, t I turned 19, uh, my, fr my beginning um, when I was a freshman. Kwani, you do not do national youth service? No, the, I, me, me. Then, bless, national... you cannot be disciplined. Uh, You're not disciplined. Uh, huh? You're not disciplined. <laughs> me, the NYS I've had is only through the, the scandals. Me, I only know that one. I was also part of the crew that, Grace, you were telling me that you did O levels, A levels. Me, I yeah. was an for four kid and um during the time i was one of the last my my year was one of the last years where you had one year a compulsory one year in between before you started university and because i was coming to university in the u.s i got to start a year earlier than my peers would have if they were going into public university uh but grace you were talking about o levels a levels and then university. yes we had o levels you know, which we finished maybe by the time we were uh 16 about 16 and 17 and then we did a levels for two years mm -hmm. during my time people could go to school at any age so in some schools you were sitting there but your grandfather or your parent we had the adult education were also sitting at the same time mm -hmm. yeah so we had all levels which is up to form four and mm -hmm. then we had a levels where you went and did form five and six and then uh we also had repeating mm -hmm. so you could repeat you're allowed to repeat up to three times so people you joined. Repeat, I think. I think that's something that we had definitely. Oh, we you had repeating too. Yeah, eight four four was really hard until uh, Moi Kibaki came and introduced the free primary education, and then the yes. started seeing older people in classes again. Yeah, so we had repeaters. So uh, we we joined university at different ages. Some mm -hmm. people joined at uh, six, uh, 20, 21, even twenty four, even thirty, depending on your circumstances in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was interesting is after Form 6, some of us did not go to National Youth Service. If you had a medical grounds or you, a doctor could write for you a letter and say you are not physically fit. So Grace, why would you go to, why would you go to National Youth Service? Because, you know, as we right. grow even knowing that it was a thing, it was only when this, uh, it started becoming a scandal and knowing money was going somewhere is when I knew people did these things. We went to NYS. Right. I don't ever know, Grace, because I never went there. But those who went told us that they were given such huge sufurias to scrub <laughs> that when you put your hand inside your hand and your head disappeared inside. <laughs> and they were made to run. They were taught how to iron their clothes with charcoal yeah. iron box. They were taught to wash. They ran around the mountains. But the most important thing, when this 844 group from the National Youth Service came to join us in campus, they had the most foul language that you could ever hear that they had learned uh -huh. from the, 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 the officers there. They were really insulted. Yeah, so they would use the same language on the lecturers. Mm -hmm. You know, they named them, they told them to sit down, they told them, oh, you know, nothing, shut up, you know. So I think they stopped it at some point. Mm -hmm. But the main aim was really to have students busy during that one year break between A level and university and also to instill some form of discipline in them because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we were going out i remember in our 20s in first year you were just let alone to the wolves like mm -hmm. the world you it was you and the world they did not train you you didn't know what you were going to get at the university mm -hmm. suddenly you had so much freedom so much time so much money and you didn't know what to do with it yeah grace what was it like uh, my my college experience was a bit drastic uh, in terms of geography because um, mm -hmm. I came from Kenya and came to a country, mm -hmm. no way, anyone. And that physical adjustment was one thing. Did you come from, what was it, where did you come uh, from? And what was it like moving into maybe Nairobi? If you went to school in Nairobi, what was it like? Was there like a, a shock just being in a different city? Well, Nairobi definitely was different uh, than from Kisumu. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Due to certain uh, circumstances in life, I did not go to school after my A-level. I did not do my A-level in school. I had to go and do it as a private candidate mm -hmm. years later. So I did not join the year with my group. I joined uh, uh, a year or two later. Mm -hmm. But it was still very different. Like Nairobi, people are suddenly seeing the big buildings and going into the big hotels. And I'm um, sorry to say some very senior people in society today were stealing uh, ketchup and yeah. spoons. <laughs> They were spoons <laughs> and the glasses from the hotels. Like, wow. They had never seen such things. Some people had never even seen a glass. You know, we used to drink 
water from the calabash and the mag yeah mm -hmm. and then the movies yeah all that stuff the cars it was it was enchanting really hey yes. Grace, let me tell you when 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 we first my first university experience here in the US i didn't know what to expect i i remember going to church and you know the the pastor would say if you go to america make sure you know you when you go to the dining hall there will be milk flowing like like water like it will be like canna <laughs> like <You> honey <laughs> <laughs> you'll have conflicts forever you know mm -hmm. so those were things that i was so excited to try out you mean i can eat you know chips and burger forever and uh, that mm. was part of the dining hall system so and also having um access to money as a form mm. of pocket money but also responsibility was one thing that was so different uh for us grace i think we say have similarities in our culture in that um in the american culture people are encouraged to young people are encouraged to start jobs early so people can start as early as 16 but for many of us college is one of the first experience with that type of expectation that you should start doing something to bring extra money in for yourself or mm. start thinking about how you're going to you know buy new bed sheets things like that on your own no, as we went, we went and we found free beds, free bed sheets, <laughs> free food. They gave us chicken and we protested. We demonstrated when the chicken sizes were not large. Oh, but no. I just like, can I reflect back in the 20s now whether it was responsible for our society, our parents, our community, yeah. our leaders to give us that kind of responsibility. Like from one to six, we were really in our parents and teachers hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, between t between school and 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 uh, and home, we never really went anywhere, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't have money. We didn't have access. We were not even allowed to be out of the house after six. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, we had this thing called boom, and mm -hmm. it was like five thousand four hundred shillings in the eighties. That was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So what did people do with this money? Well, some people drank themselves to liver cirrhosis. Like mm -hmm. they drank themselves until they got sick. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people uh, bought, women bought some nice, beautiful clothes and went down Koinange Street to uh, sell their wear. That was also part of the reality. And there are also some of our <laughs> colleagues, our... University money? The, what you're yeah, it was school? university. It was free money then, but later on, people learned that they were supposed to repay it. But people, like everybody thought it was free. Uh -huh. So people used it. Everybody had this huge TV screen grace. Mm -hmm. Huge. Like huh, the size of... Uh, a refrigerator, mm -hmm. yeah. But mm -hmm. some people use their money very responsibly, mm -hmm. yeah. Some people use their money to pay bills for their uh, families who are in mm -hmm. hospital. Mm -hmm. And I remember one or two of my classmates in first year who educated all their kids throughout throughout campus. Wow. She educated five or six of their of of her brothers and sisters mm -hmm. right through primary through secondary, and you know. Mm -hmm. that was really really like very responsible of them mm -hmm. you know but uh, handing that money was quite it was quite a trick and some people bought books and there are people who did, never bought any books they kept just uh borrowing borrowing yeah. borrowing books but that and, brings us grace back to um discipline and caning mm -hmm. what is it that made some of us survive through all this you know, I can't believe that you, you know, I, 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 I respect my mother so much or my, the, my elder so much that I believe that they, 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 could, they would feel justified in, in caning me at this age. But Grace, I can't imagine someone realistically saying, by the way, I'll beat you. <laughs> Even as a 19 or a 20 year old. Um, oh, some people were caned when they were 20s. That there's a lady whose parents came and caned her at the university because they came and she was not in her room and they waited the whole night and she did not come back. <laughs> they caned her. They caned her in first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, say hi to Orange. How are you? How are you? Welcome to the Kumichachi show. Ranko is watching as well. Grace, for for me, I would characterize the twenties for um, if we if I could use. Uh, term to characterize what my 20s has been like it's maybe mm -hmm. hustling um, <clears throat> starting off as an international student um, mm -hmm. as much as we had the the physical separation or the independence uh, because uh, we don't for, for international students most of the time your parents don't stay with you um, you have mm -hmm. to those those instances are pushed upon you you don't decide if you're going to choose to pay something or not it becomes your responsibility 
And part of that was uh, within the first, I believe, 90 days or six months of an international student is trying very much to get your social security number so that you can pick up jobs uh, because as an international student, you're limited to jobs on campus. So even if, you know, uh, you'd raise money, you know, you, your parents would try and arm you the best that they can before you leave for the U.S. But once you come to the U.S., you realize money goes by so quickly. Uh, mm. In between books, in between just getting small, small things, your money goes by very fast. So one of the first things I had to worry about was, am I going to be able, even able to work in this country? You know, I went to the, the, universe, um, the international student's office within one week and said, what can I do? Help connect me to somewhere I can get my social security. Because I don't want to, um, I had a fear and an expectation that, you know, your, par your, your family has done so much to bring you to university. It's your responsibility to do as much as you can to not burden them and also start giving back. You know, people give their cows and their sheep and, and their salary to bring you for you to be complaining, calling and saying, oh, you know, send me $100. I don't have this. I don't have money for soap. That's not excusable. Uh, so, you know, as much as parents will, we, we, we are not very directly associated with parents once we get to university, the pressures actually, you feel like you are coming out by yourself, you know, you don't have the cushioning of maybe going to family over the holidays or things like that. Um, it forces you to start thinking very, very realistically on how you can feed yourself, house yourself, things like that. So, so yeah. Trace, now that you raised that issue of money, it raises for me two points. One of them, uh, just remembering what we discussed earlier about mm -hmm. uh, the, the harambes or the contributions they make for you at home before you yeah. come here. People hold a fundraising, the whole bus during my time escorted you to the airport in the mm -hmm. 20s. We escorted people to the airport. Mm -hmm. But the money that was contributed by the whole village, when you came here, what happened? Did it, was it enough? Did it, send, did it just mess you up completely? Did it make you complete your studies or did it interfere with your studies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> sometimes we, we, part of it is, you know, when we are at home, we, we cannot possibly anticipate the types of how much things will cost. Because you remember, Grace, we have an article on tujipange.com that talks about how within the first six months to a year, we are busy calculating things from American funds to, you at home, you from American to Kenyan. And so I think part of us, our thinking or when we're budgeting, we're budgeting in terms of that uh, Kenyan mindset. Oh, it will cost me 100 bob to go to the bank. It will cost me 200 yes. bucks. But when you come to the ground, you find that it's actually $10 or $20. So money goes by quickly. And the, it becomes harder to explain to your family why the money is going that much. Because what are you going to say? <laughs> you know? And so yeah, so there are a lot of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of people who had harambes done for them. But when they came here, they found that the money could only last one semester or two semesters. Yeah. yeah. So they had to get into doing other things that they, had not, they were not supposed to do. They changed their careers. Mm -hmm. You know, then they went, went into a guilt trip and then disconnected from home because they were not able to meet the expectations as required by the families who had sent them here. And Grace, I think there was also before, I believe, maybe um, September 11th, 2001, uh, when mm. you could come to the U.S. and there wasn't as much ICE tracking, the, the tracking of uh, uh, immigrants, uh, it wasn't as prevalent back then. So people would come sometimes for one semester and uh, drop out and uh, at that time they could work. They could find work uh, if a, an employer was not really wondering if you are valid, you know, you are authorized to work. Some people would mm. come semester, drop out, try and work these jobs and eventually hope to go back to school. But it ended up putting a lot of people in a, a lot of tough situations when new regulations came in where they want people wanted to, you know, employers wanted to look at your social security and they found mm. that you were not eligible to work. So a lot of the... Uh, challenges that uh, people here in the U.S. are facing of from Kenya and things like that has been to, due to such of, such decisions. You're trying to find a way to make ends meet so that you can eventually go back to school, but you end up falling out of status when you're trying to make those ends meet. You know, and then you, you, people ask you, why don't you come home? Why don't you come home? Why don't you come home? Uh, some of the reason is because if I come, I'm not uh, going to be able to come back because I messed up my status a while ago. 
Um, so it can be, you know, the 20s is a year of risk. A lot of things are happening around that time. Um, you can make decisions that come back to you. Financially also, Grace, let me tell you, when mm. you come here, you realize you can get credit cards. And you realize... Yes, hey, yes. On top of the loans you're talking about, you can get lo you can get credit card to almost do a lot of things. If you have a co-signer, uh, you can go on vacations, you can you can buy that big TV, you know, until years pass by and bills start coming and then you realize, oh, wow, all that partying I was doing is coming back to hit me. You have bills. You to, yes. And literally, yeah. Chris, when you said, you know, people are wondering how they're going to maybe pay, pay their mortgage, think about retirement, a lot of the decisions that led to you know, to these types of issues probably happened in the 20s. You know, you took out a big yeah. loan, you took out a big vacation, you paid like 5,000, you've been paying it off for like 10 years. Um, yeah. I feel like decisions happened in the 20s as well. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know how it, it is here, how it was for you here in the early 20s when you joined college, because um, did you have any pre-guidance and counseling on what kind of courses you take? Because when we joined university, we just arrived there. Nobody <laughs> told us. <laughs> we just arrived, went to the dean's office, uh, then we were sent to the halls, given the keys for our rooms, given a roommate. Yeah. And then we just heard from people like, oh, you can go and register in sociology. Oh, you can go do philosophy. Oh, you can yeah. go do um, fine art. We did not know what these were. We just went because our classmates, our friends were doing the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we did not really pick uh, careers or choice. We did not choose exactly what we wanted to do. We just went with the flow, especially if you had a, an influential voice, some former powerful prefect. were like, don't go for philosophy. What's philosophy? Go do uh, sociology. No, do geography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get proper guidance. What happened here? What happens here be when you join college? Yeah, Grace, I think um, just speaking from someone who came up, did the application process, my selection of my courses were heavily influenced by the same things you're talking about now. It was doctor, lawyer, teacher, engineer, you know, those mm. are the things or biochemist or things like that. So I followed that. And I would say that the, the 20s were for, for me, uh, uh, an age for me to bring my own voice out because um, as much as I, I was put into these courses, I knew that uh, I came to realize that uh, my university provided guidance and counseling, but I'd not received education to tell me that I could actually go to them and ask for help because I thought that if I went to guidance and counseling, they would just tell me what someone I, I, I'd had before. You know, I always mm -hmm. assumed if I went to an, an authority figure, they'll just tell me, why go and do it go and do that other one so i didn't know how to 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 find those resources and i was afraid to ask um so it was only when i i sat back and i said i, I don't know what i'm doing uh is when mm -hmm. i gathered the courage to ask my the international students office one thing i appreciate about the 20s here and universities here is that uh, there are a lot of uh, support services that you can lean to, whether it, it's maybe a professor or like international students for me, they can help direct you to people who can help you ask these questions. And it's not bad if you ask it. Um, I feel like a lot of my peers in Kenya uh, always complained about professors who are just there to teach the class and go. So in addition to just having this go and do this, they, they had issues with some of their professors in terms of them getting the guidance they needed to feel like they were doing so, something. I would give credit to the University of Nairobi. I don't know about the other universities. I went to the University of Nairobi for both my undergraduate and, and postgraduate. Mm -hmm. But there, there was something called orientation week mm -hmm. where the professors came and talked about their different uh, disciplines. But we really didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah, how <laughs> we do you? They, were, they were telling us what for philosophy is, geography, <laughs> history, but we really didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we didn't know what what that meant for us. We just know there was three, 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 two, three, two. So we just followed other people blindly. Those yeah. who had come a year before us or two years before us, we just followed them. You know, like the way we followed other kids in school, in high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't have like really proper uh, counseling. But I think like now the world has changed. Like parents are really, truly involved mm -hmm. in their, uh, in their uh, children's education. And I guess in those days, the parents of the 20s did not really have that much background in university education, but they did try their best to educate us. Mm 
mm-hmm. but they did not uh, they were not in PTA and all these committees you know that uh, involve education mm-hmm. there's also a lot yeah. of um access to information about different programming uh, universities yeah. have even looked at Kenyan universities they put a lot of information out there about what to expect around the courses that you do and so younger people can start making those decisions for themselves early it's not like you had to go to university to then figure out what was what you wanted or not uh, that's why um, high school counseling is so important because by the time you get to school you want to get in on the right foot not necessarily like try and find your way as much as you can uh so the more inf- more information is being in the power of people earlier on uh so grace we've talked about um the financial aspect of things how that freedom can bring about significant risk um but let's talk a bit about living arrangements because that's one of the things that you know they talk about uh, the the 20s being the age of uh, hypertension and pressure every time mm. Someone calls from home. It's oh yeah, you know this this boy, this boy, this girl, this girl. You know. Yeah, twenties. <laughs> twenties is a year of some serious decision making because yeah. if you finish college, you get your first job, then there are expectations required yeah. from you, and then how? What kind of life are you going to lead? Are you going to yeah. live with a boyfriend? Are you going to move yeah. into an apartment? And your parents expect you to get a good match because they invested in you. They yeah. expect you to uh, pass all your exams with flying colors, mm-hmm. uh, get a good apartment. buy a car get a good husband mm-hmm. fit, doctor engineer you mm-hmm. know don't come don't bring someone you found selling <laughs> peanuts you know at the bus right. stop right but here it's kind of different tell me more about that like so grace i think also when i always talk i am talking from my experience uh, as an immig- immigrant student um mm. you find life moves so fast for us once you finish mm. school you have to find um optical optional practical training which is a year that is given to you to study in the United States where it's work for you to build your experience and part of that is figuring out where you're going to stay um some people decide to um if that does not work out you don't have a an, an sponsoring agency people will come back home and many times they end up you know the first point of safety is staying with their family until they can get a job and move out but for those of us who have stayed it's starting to figure out finances uh while you're doing this where will you stay with some people stay with roommates some people stay with host families some people decide to if they're in relationships they decide to move in with their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their partner in order to save costs and for people who maybe have more money or financial ability they move into apartments um in fact this was one of the things when i was graduating from school when i was a senior i mean from a university when i was a senior it was this narrative that you know for for when people were graduating there was a sense of if you're graduating and you're graduating successfully you were you already have a job lined up that you're going to start in 2 weeks you have a roommate who you know you have a nice apartment that you're going to share with your roommate or you're going to have a house and you already have a plan to buy a new car because now you can afford it so for us it was uh, that was the expectation very few people went back and lived with their families in fact it was it is frowned upon people who stay with their families always talk about how quickly they can move out and live independently you know? grace wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute yeah. when you're saying you're moving in with a roommate is this roommate a girl or a boy sometimes it doesn't matter sometimes it matters it matters because in the tw- when in my 20s <laughs> you could not do such a thing like what did you mean yeah. sharing a room with a, a boy oh here in the us you will find multiple combinations that people... is very very serious that yeah is... they... i am old school like <laughs> how 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 did you start sharing a room with a boy you know and especially it... your your classmate yeah, yeah. so this is after school during school it was very rare that you were put to live together but for some places actually they, they will say someone would rent a two bedroom apartment in one bedroom they would have one bedroom out to let and some of these rooms are self contained and they would say well i'm a i'm a male i or i'm a female i they would say i can only stay with i only accepting male applicants i'm only accepting female applicants or anyone is welcome so grace yeah let me tell you people and especially grace now in, in our 20s um even with the american culture they encourage independence very early on 
uh, Grace, you were talking about some similarities in Kenya where families or parents are known to kick up their, their children out at 18 and say... Yes, so out. there are communities in Kenya yeah. that um, when the child gets to 16 years old, that's no longer a child. Well, if yeah. you finish your Form 4 secondary school, they send you away. They buy you a bed, they give you some gifts and tells you go, tell you to go start a new life. Yeah. That's kind of in old school communities. Yeah. But... In most cases, especially when you are a woman, a girl child, you could not live on your own. Even if you got a job in Nairobi, you either had to yeah. live with a real cousin, not Kazinda, a real cousin, <laughs> <laughs> a real uncle, a real, not the yeah. word real, real. Like your father's <laughs> brother, your father's mother, your father, not, not general cousin, not general cousin, not adopted cousin. Yeah? yeah. Or it's glad to be a family friend who had been tested, tried, mm -hmm. you know, Faithful yeah. to the family. Some, uh, so Chris, I mean, a, a family friend that was considered uh -huh. uh, almost like family, like parents to you. So There's Chris, no way you could you, move. How did you do it? Where did you go? When you finished school, what, 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 what was your next When you point? finished school, you moved in with a relative. Uh -huh. Either family friend in the church, a church pastor, uh, a sister, a brother, if you are lucky. Or you mm -hmm. could move to a hostel, but the Many parents prefer that you just go back home or work in a place near home mm -hmm. because that was the most dangerous thing. Was a, a single woman renting her own apartment, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that was considered as uh, immoral and you're considered uh, as an, a new commercial sex worker in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they did not like it at all. So if, mm -hmm. if you had a good job and you were tired of living with relatives because you had to contribute and sometimes the contribution was not fair, so you'd move into an apartment. Mm -hmm. You'd wake up in the morning and find some cousins had arrived from the village <laughs> with very big suitcases, big, like they'd come to live for five years. And yeah. you know, you could not send them away because at some point in your life you had been assisted. And it also yeah. showed that you are, you are, you are not a Jawat. You are not someone who loved relatives. You didn't love family. Yeah. And it mm -hmm. would be embarrassing to your family if you send them back. Yeah. yeah. So, so there was nothing like you're living alone. Living alone was also considered to be kind of a, a witch, witch kind of witchery kind of behavior. Like if you're a wizard or a witch, <laughs> you know, America but has 500,000 members of the witch, witch society, witches and wizards. If they, come, if they came here, they would find so many witches and wizards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I see, I, I see Grace, you millennials just find it easy to just move in with a, a boy. You, you just move in with a man like that. You could not do that during my time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the parents had to know who his parents were. This is mm -hmm. how it happened. Mm -hmm. If you were moved to the city and you met someone you liked, you would go to their parents' home and your parents knew they were, you were going to their home. Then the man would come to your home. Then your parents would visit their man's home. Then the man's parents would visit your home. Then now you talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you are living together, you one, you are living in sin, and two, you are hard-headed wang tech. <laughs> bull-headed yeah. bull like bull-headed yeah. buffalo-headed kind of a character <laughs> that was not acceptable in society <laughs> you know Grace, yeah but yeah, here so i find true. you here you guys find it so easy to just move in like moving moving with a boyfriend like if you died there we would, they would just come and take you away and that person was not recognized you know, Grace, I feel like sometimes, you know, you people, you, you, not wingy, kidogo. You come in. You millennials are too much. Like, when we are with mechacha, with millennials, if you're not brought back in shape, you are going to take over the world. Because you guys are like buffalo, bull headed, independent buffaloes. I feel like I think the big issue is I think people do that in their 30s and even in their 40s. But maybe the, the thing that's happening that's different is younger and younger people are making those decisions. Um, uh. So instead of finding maybe someone who's saying, yeah, I'm an adult, I'm in my 30s, 40s, and they decide to live like that, you're finding mm -hmm. younger people making those decisions. And some of that is yes. just, you know, that's been normalized or uh, you've been raised, you know, nowadays, like you said, Grace, in our, in our Kenyan culture, it's very rare to find that for people advertising that. Uh, but here, mm. you know, it's kind of normalized. Uh, they say if you love someone, then and you feel like you're you're good about your decision, then people do it. Uh, people if you love someone, there's no structure. You just there's take no... them and, and, and from the <laughs> streets and move in with them. <laughs> and you asked me to not do that, but I can see times have changed, and that's why I realize I'm getting old. Yeah. Because, uh, wow.
But Grace, you know what? I think this is an interesting topic because it it leans upon that conversation of morality. When you go to school, yeah. you're learning philosophy and sociology, and san, you know, and suddenly you start questioning. What the... Grace, <laughs> what are you, what are you? Now that you meant to mention sociology, philosophy, can you remember the day Jesus came to Nairobi? <laughs> Jesus came to Nairobi twice that we've seen. <laughs> Jesus came to Nairobi, I tell you. Which brings us to the... <laughs> I saw Jesus in Nairobi. It was Kawangware. Kawangware. He came to Maria Kasa's church. Between Kawangware and Kangemi. <laughs> he so came to Nairobi raised... dressed in a turban. Yeah. So, so Grace, this is what you've happened. Been raised, you've been raised fundamentally, you know, I grew up, you know, some SDA, uh, what was it, Anglican, you know, you go to church every Saturday, you go to church every Sunday. I will Sunday, never forget Jesus' face. You know, and then you go to university, and then you're told, Grace, you're saying that in, in philosophy you learn that, you know, Christianity and it, at its core is a Jewish religion, and you know, is, is he white, is he not? Yeah, you know. and it affected our going to yeah. church. Yeah, yeah. Because we were told that uh, Christianity was a, a, an ancient religion, a Western religion that had come by sheep, and it really yeah. did not belong to us, and that they came with Bibles, told us to close our eyes, and they stole our land. Yeah. Yeah. And then they gave yeah. us the history of, uh, of slave trade and how they, uh, treated, how they killed thousands of strong, you know, Africans uh, uh, whom they uh, uh, kidnapped or some were sold through the chiefs, some were already prisoners of war. But uh, for me in the 20s, the church was a ritual for me. Like there was no two ways about it. Most of us, we, we did all the stuff we did during the week, mm -hmm. but on Sunday, it was a holiday. Like we went for mass or we went to church. Uh, the SDAs went for their Saturday. Uh, the Muslims uh, girls went to the mosque, mm -hmm. down Jamia Mosque every Friday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were excused from classes. Mm -hmm. But when we started seeing other stuff, like when Jesus arrived in Nairobi that time when in college, <laughs> was we were like, wait, Jesus came this Jesus was a nation? <laughs> First he arrived that it would, he would come in three days. So people were ready. They wore white clothes. As we were, we were students, we were curious. Yeah. This Jesus came in a Volkswagen. <laughs> he arrived in a white Volkswagen. And people brought uh, lep uh, lepers, uh, people with disabilities and they preached that the lame would walk, the blind would see, mm -hmm. people would talk in tongues, the Holy Spirit would come and sweep through Kawangware, Kangemi, Kabete, all over Nairobi. <laughs> so people brought carried their children who yeah. were sick. Yeah. And when this Jesus arrived, this Jesus that came in a Volkswagen, a turban and, and a beard, when he arrived, he got out of the Volkswagen, waved at people for just one minute and got back in the Volkswagen. <laughs> Sometimes you sit and, back and you're like, wow, wow, Aki, what, Aki Kenyans. <laughs> we started questioning, like, really, is this what Christianity is about? Do we want to yeah. go to church? And this has gone on over the over time, yeah? Grace, you go to college, saying... you have so much freedom, you yes. start uh, questioning a lot of things. You feel now you have money, you are out of your parents' hands. Do you even have to go to church and mm -hmm. see this kind of nonsense mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. sense? It made sense yeah. to some people. Yeah, for some yeah. people, that uh, college is their spiritual awakening. Sometimes it's not just questioning your, you know, religion, and maybe some people turn into, you know, decide to be atheists. Some people can switch to other religions, you know, because now they yeah. Yeah. they can ex they they've been opened up to different ways of thinking about things. And I'm sure this has, this has caused a lot of family conflict um, among yes. my friends. Um, finally, not not have, having Sunday free. Grace, just having Sunday free for the first time in your life because when you were born, you went to church. When you went to primary school, you went to church. Throughout, yeah. In secondary, you went to church three times a week. Uh, for some, for example, like in a in an Anglican uh, in, uh, high school, I went to an Anglican high school. We had mm -hmm. prayers almost every day. We had church, you know, maybe four times a week, five times a week. And for some mm -hmm. people, they said, wow, wow. Wow, I can sleep in on Sunday, you know. Mm. I can I can wash my clothes, I can relax, I can party on Saturday and relax on Sunday. And so, you know, people start stop going to church. And they say, Well, I can pray at home, you know. <laughs> I can pray at yes. home, things like that. So yes. your your view on religion, your view on spirituality also has the opportunity to evolve around this time. 
and because it's also the fam the family expectation uh maybe you, it may be even small things like change switching from pentecostal to another different type of yeah of, of yeah practice uh, yeah. denomination uh when you have that adole everyone grace you're saying all these problems uh, is just blamed on adole adole Adole. Yeah, everybody had an adolescent <laughs> problem. So when you had serious problems, I would say Adole was eating you up. Yeah. yeah. Adolescent, the word was abused then and we were not really misunderstood. Yeah. But the, we faced serious challenges which needed counseling, which needed therapy, which needed listening to. But nobody listened to us. They just dismissed it as Adole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah especially if you were facing challenges like uh, the... Uh, uh, uh if you are getting violated or, or molested by teachers in the school or yeah. something had happened during the holidays you wanted to share yeah. it you were acting up they would yeah. say oh that's a dolly yeah. yeah yeah but i still i think still think our our guidance our leaders did the best they could mm -hmm. grace we had so much trust in our teachers mm -hmm. right from school they were almost like our second gods we believed everything they said so when we went to do philosophy and the uh, philosophy lecturer started asking us where is god you know what is god anything can be God. Even this table is God, you know. It's just like, wow, this professor knows. <laughs> then the professor would ask us, how many people, how many of your relatives have died? Did they come back and tell you about the other world? There's nothing like the other world. The second coming is the day you die. That's the day Jesus has come back. <laughs> so we were getting different teachings yeah. than what we had learned when we grew up. But yeah. a lot of times, uh, so when you went back on holiday, some people would tell their parents, oh, there's no God. You know, um, so they said, oh, these kids who are educated, mm -hmm. uh, well educated, uh, being, uh, it's not good, it's not great to educate your child because they lose themselves, they lose religion in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That idea yeah. of rebellion, right? Yeah, Re rebellion. Yeah. Rebellion was such a big issue. Yeah. Very, very big issue. Yeah. And then Grace, uh, coming down as we... Uh, all, almost wind up before we talk about the five great lessons we learned from our 20s. Mm -hmm. We're talking about property. Yes. And uh, in, in the 20s, we did not own any property. In your 20s, yeah. Yeah, yeah we didn't, women did not own property. We did not, did not own bank accounts. Well, some of us did not have IDs. And if you had an ID, then you had to hand it over to your husband or your father. Like you, you, you are not supposed to. We were part of the property then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think in around 2001, uh, Kenya, about six years ago, we That's were inherited. Women were inherited along with um, everything else. Like when I, I, I remember a lot of uh, uh, women in the community suffered when their husbands died. They had mm -hmm. to be inherited. Those who mm -hmm. agreed to be inherited suffered uh, serious um, diseases. Like then 80s is when HIV came yeah, mm -hmm. with a full force. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women and their children died. But if you did not agree to be inherited, then they chased you away. You lost your yeah. land. You lost yeah. everything that you, you'd ever uh, acquired. Oh, but mm -hmm. when the government passed, the, I was just looking at my notes. When the government, when Kenya passed the Matrimonial Property Act six years ago, mm -hmm. it joined a series of laws protecting women's access to property. Yeah. So this reinforces equal rights enshrined in the constitution. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, uh, because of patriarchal traditions where uh, a lot of our uh, property belongs to the male, the male, the male, the male, there's a lack of awareness up to now about our rights and mm -hmm. what we should really get. So I don't know, a lot of women walked away from their marriages and said, oh, I hate that man. I hate being uh, tortured so much that I don't want anything, mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. to do with the person. I don't even want a, a shilling from them because mm -hmm. they did not realize that you had contributed in very many ways in that relationship. And what I like about the new law is that it allows you to register the property and you register the property along with your husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, the law takes into account what you have contributed to the marriage, not just in terms of f cash, but, but uh, in terms of time, in terms of washing dishes, in terms of having children and taking care of them, in terms of cleaning the house, all the little things. You know, when you ask a housewife, oh, what do you do? I do nothing. No, mm -hmm. everything that you're doing, uh, housewifery is a full-time job. And if you ever separated or divorced from your partner, they will give you the amount of time. They will calculate and tabulate how much time you spent doing mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about yeah. you, Grace? In your 20s, did you own any property? No, I didn't own any property. I think, uh, Grace, with um, more financial responsibility and possibly more financial independence working in the U.S., <clears throat> 
there's a lot of questions about how to to invest money safely we've already talked about how uh financial finan good financial decisions and possibly you can get yourself in financial risk in the 20s um to uh opportunities have increased actually in Kenya to own property to own land and that's where a lot of assets diasporans are usually engaged with family or friends or even marketing mm -hmm. to hey invest here invest here it's so easy sometimes they bring you oh it's easy you can do banking there's easy down payment um it has been a double edged sword because uh there have been so many horror stories of people giving their money to family to help negotiate a transaction and then you come and mm -hmm. you find there's nothing there um there's mm -hmm. uh, us being guided still feeling like uh, those are the people who our elders are people that we still can trust value has sometimes ended up in 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 just embarrassment for everyone when uh, you make these investments so you talk to someone in in terms of how do i make my money last in kenya and you come back yeah. and oh no 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 nothing has happened and the because cows died you the cows died yeah the materials were stolen yeah and the person got someone got sick yeah yeah, yeah. it's hard to have that conversation because you assume wow this is my a member of my family am i going to start chasing them or also it's a sign you know you also you also respectful that this is your how do you have that financial conversation with an elder about something that they have done or something that they have not done regarding your money um so as much money, yeah as much as this, you can own property you can get you can get into merry go round schemes uh, in the 20s can be risky because you don't know you, you know unless you take the time to learn a lot about what's happening in Kenya and make good financial decisions you often have to rely mm -hmm. on someone who's who has more experience in it to 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 do to make some of those decisions for you but i don't know whether the elders of nowadays have changed or whether we have younger grandmothers i hear some grandmothers are 40 years old <laughs> <laughs> and some yeah. are 37. But <laughs> during my time in my 20s, which I really cherish, I have such nostalgic memories about it. Elders were trusted. I remember when I got my first boom and I gave it to my elders and, and they used it for something important. I think they had, they planted like a lot of groundnuts and that money generated another, um, a lot of money that built another restaurant, you know. So elders were trustworthy then you know yeah. i remember i gave one of my uncles uh, a cow to keep for me and the cow had a lot of other uh, calves and uh, you know that generation of calves just went on and on and there was permanent milk mm -hmm. but these young grandparents <laughs> these young grandparents who are, who are now money hungry like <laughs> these millennial grandparents, grandparents who still want to wear stilet i don't know i don't know what to do but some of the stories like this this gets <laughs> I do not know what to do, but Grace, I am challenged now with a younger generation like you who are talking investments, talking stock exchange, talking mm -hmm. table banking, talking mm -hmm. um, low, um, um, retirement, you know, talking mm -hmm. vacation. But mm -hmm. I am in my mid 50s and I haven't done any of this. Like, where exactly did the rain begin to beat us? Like, as mm -hmm. were this generation of us in our 50s, what went wrong? Mm -hmm. yeah. Am I the only one? Am I the only one who has no money for retirement? Why am I beginning to save money at 50? Like, mm -hmm. what, what what went wrong? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because property is so important. And just going back to the figures, uh, the data gathered by FIDA, the Federation of Women Lawyers, says that despite the fact that about 32% of households in Kenya are run by women, only 1% of land titles and property are owned by women. Mm -hmm. And only 5% of these men have joined the, uh, the title deeds of their land with, the men, with their wives the, for, the, for the land. So mm -hmm. what is happening? Women can now buy and register land individually, and they can inherit from their parents. We have had a lot of uh, backlash, a lot of um, resistance from our brothers, and some people have had to give up on that. But the law actually allows you. Parents don't have to split their um, property between your brothers anymore. Everybody, everybody, mm -hmm. everybody uh, uh, is now an equal in that. And even in polygamous marriages, each wife is given a portion of the land according to their contribution. You may have, have come there as a second wife or mm -hmm. third wife, and mm -hmm. you did not come with anything. You came and found when the first wife and the second wife, uh, first wife and the husband had laid the foundation, and you came and found a already made home for you. But whatever you contribute after that, yeah, whatever the portion you contribute after that, will be given to you when the when your husband dies so 
you 20s are really setting us on our toes. You millennials are setting us in your mm -hmm. toes because you are doing things that we were not able to do. Mm -hmm. But we also have so much to learn from you as the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we always are giving you instructions. We're always telling you, oh, how can you do this? How mm -hmm. can you do that? Oh, you went on vacation last week. You're going on another vacation. But you have saved the money. It's mm -hmm. coming out of your excess. I'm not taking a loan to go on vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we have a lot to learn from you millennials. Yeah, we have a lot. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. I think the youthful, uh, the youthful uh, uh, tolerance for risk taking is definitely something that we have for better or for yeah. worse. Um, but yeah. I think we always, I, I think this is a point of connection is the things that we are, we are trying to do here are things that you probably thought about or, you know, there's, I think there's an opportunity for mentorship or an, a, an opportunity for us to learn from each other both ways. Because um, when it comes to setting yourself up for later on, making better decisions for later on, I think you, the older generation, can come and lend a voice to that, being practical, being realistic. Um, I think there's a, as much as we try to learn from the internet, uh, there's nothing quite like that first-hand experience that people who have gone through that experience, yeah. whether they succeeded or not, is, ma is, a, is so much powerful. And uh, nowadays, younger people are being welcomed into spaces where older people are. In the past, there was always, a, 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 you know, stratified. You know, yeah, older people hung out here, younger people hung out here, and there's an information gap in how to deal with practical things. So we need to bridge that gap so that at least we're sharing information about how can you be creative and also how can you maintain budget? How can you make, you know, put yourself through a series of making rational decisions? You know, because mm -hmm. um, in today's age, all of us are worried about retirement. I think in the, in the age of America, uh, they talk about um, if the retirement age is 65, but some people cannot afford to go to retirement. Half of the country cannot afford to go into retirement at 65. So maybe it's it's part of a bigger issue that's not maybe maybe personal short failing. Sometimes it's just, this is the type of economy that we live in and we need to find ways to stretch our dollars more, but still have fun and enjoy ourselves. And Grace, I also uh, remembering my 20s when someone uh, died, someone... Um by bad luck, lost a member of the family. We were just, we just raised a fundraiser. We just yeah. opened a book and people wrote their names and donated. But you millennials seem to get annoyed when we ask you for money to donate every day. Like you <laughs> think we should have our own insurance and all that. What would you advise those of us who yeah. are having a challenge with that? Yeah, I, you know, I would say from my personal experience, um, unless it's, I don't know what would cause um, someone to feel that family contribution is a bother, especially when we have WhatsApp groups from, you know, a lot of us are connected to family WhatsApp groups where we get this information. Um, there's also a big culture around table banking, supporting each other, that young people are actually starting to get into. It's not something that only older people contribute to, towards each other. There are also online platforms where people can go and ask for money online. So I would say that whoever, if, there's, if there are millennials who are truly against this idea of sharing, I think that's a really personal issue. Because uh, I mm. feel like a lot of us have gone through a lot of things, um, especially as we're, maybe someone is just hard up. Maybe if they, they, you know me, I don't like being called a beggar. I don't have the money for, any, for the funerals, but I don't like being called a beggar. Like yeah. a beggar, beggar. Yeah, <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so Grace, Grace, what are some yeah. of the lessons we learned from our twenties as we come to uh, towards the last quarter of our show? Mm -hmm. Seven of four. Mm. Yeah. So let me start with uh, for me um, as we wrap up. The most important thing that I've learned in these uh, this decade has been to run at your own pace. I know we started in the beginning around pace. Who are your pace setters? Um, but mm. it can be uh, pressure to look around you in your 20s and seeing people advanced, advance at stages that you think you should be getting to, um, especially mm. the pressure to have a, you know, a, a paying job, a stable relationship, uh, a home, investments, you know, things that, or a car. You know, there's a lot of pressure when you look around the people around you doing what they're doing. And, you know, my message for me has always been to think about my own race and the race that I'm running. 
Uh, because when I look at other people, I feel a lot of anxiety. I feel a lot of pressure that I should be there. Um, I feel self-conscious about my own. That was a call interrupting. I feel self-conscious about my own journey. And I've come to realize, and it's, it's continual progress, I come to realize that it's important to be gentle with myself. If this is a year for make a decade for making risks, making mistakes. It's also an opportunity for me to to make to have great success. Uh, so it's important for me to be gentle on myself. Um, and if things happen, it's not the end of the world. Uh, it can be really hard, Grace. There's you know so many successful people, so many people doing great yeah. things, and you're looking back and you're saying, why didn't I get that? Why didn't I do that? I'm young. My time is running out. You know, even in our twenties, we always, I always feel like, oh, what will happen when you turn 30? Your life is over when you turn 30. But Grace, what we've mm. been saying all along is life can begin even at 50. So yeah, I need to be gentle with myself a lot. Yes, it is okay to make mistakes. I would say it is not the end of mm -hmm. the world. Whatever happens, you get pregnant, you lose all your money, you lose your home. You lose your apartment, you have to live in a car, you're homeless, it is not the end of the life. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of life. You don't give up. Don't give up. Each yeah. new day brings its own blessing. Yeah, it's you okay to make mistakes. Be gentle. Just be gentle yeah. on yourself. You get turned down for a lot of things because you're probably yeah. testing out a lot of things. And that can be very mm -hmm. discouraging, especially early on in the career. So, you know, it's important to continue, you know, being gentle with yourself. It it may just mean that it was not for you doesn't mean that you were wrong or you were bad it's just that it was not the opportunity for you at that time yeah and facebook is not a, an, a gps like do not be gps by facebook do not let facebook twitter instagram yeah. uh, be your guide to life those of us mm -hmm. who grew up in our 20s we never saw such things we still are tra even trying to uh find out how to use the different kinds of uh <laughs> programs that are there so it's really for me i'm lucky i'm happy i grew up in that generation where Whatever people post on Facebook does not matter to me because half a ground is different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Half right, a ground, right. if you go to the person's real life, it's different. Yeah. It yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ground ground is equally very different mm -hmm. from the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. people uh, juxtapose posts. People put uh, people go in front of other people's cars in mm -hmm. big hotels and yeah. post pictures like they're in front of their houses, you know. So it's all some, some uh, most of it is not true. Mm -hmm. But uh, go at your own pace. This pace setters thing is a new thing for me. Mm -hmm. Even though Eliuti, our very own Eliuti, <laughs> even though he brought his own pace setters, but remember, he's already an accomplished person. He's a world celebrity. He had to go through his own pace first before yeah. he finally got the pace setters. And you could see his own pace setters are also uh, ce uh, celebrities, achievers in their own. They've reached almost yeah. their maximum. So yeah. don't go with other people's pace just because we, the pace setters thing came up. It was a good inspiration. But mm -hmm. check ground. Check the ground. Mm -hmm. How is ground? It's ground. Mm -hmm. Ground is very different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. make sure you're grounded. Make sure you can uh, live according to your means. That's what I'll add. Live mm -hmm. according to your means. Cut your clothes according to your size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because each of us are different. We have different challenges. We have different salaries. We have different expectations. Some of us are caring for sick people. Some are caring for people who are terminally ill. So you can't compare yourself with someone who is maybe an only child, doing well, traveling all over the world. The parents yeah. are already invested in them, put for them a trust fund 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So they're living in excess. They go to work because they're bored at home. Mm -hmm. They don't come to work because they need the money. So never compare yourself with another person. Mm -hmm. so they'll always be a better person, a greater person than you. But mm -hmm. you're also always greater than someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Grace, what could um, you share from your experience? Mm. The other thing I would like to share from my experience is saving. Saving is important. Saving, you do not have to be a, a millennial to save. I started saving many, many years ago. 20, when I was 20, when I was in high school, they gave us pocket money. I always saved for a rainy day. And one of my favorite songs is, please save for a rainy day. Did you save for a rainy day? When it rains, I ask myself, did I save for a rainy day? Right now it's raining in Philadelphia and I've asked mm -hmm. myself, have I saved for this rainy day? A rainy day is coming. Do not use your last cent. We have a, a culture here though. I didn't see it back home where 
people use they, have, they spend all their money you're mm. paid on friday people pay bills people go buy chicken people go buy clothes by monday people broke yeah <laughs> but always true. save something for a rainy day don't spend your last up to your very last cent because nobody yeah. knows about tomorrow yeah and it's you yeah. know it's easy to think like that because you're thinking hey i'll eat ramen you know noodles i'll eat especially now pre-packaged food frozen food can be so much cheaper and mm-hmm. that's part of can lead into my next tip which is about um, eating healthy when you're talking about foundation it's not just psychological it's not that just financial it's a health foundation how you start building up your body or taking care of your body will help uh with helping improve your health condition or decrease your uh, likelihood to develop certain diseases later on they talk about mm-hmm. having a healthy diet and exercise helping to address hypertension and pressure issues down the line uh they talk about how eating vegetables can extend your lifespan if you start early they talk about you know once people get older you start bending you start you know your body starts doing things and part of that mm-hmm. is you know, they talk about posture starts early on in life so even as i'm thinking mm-hmm. i challenge myself to say wow you know 20s are the age for me to really start thinking about what i'm putting into my body as much as you want to you know live life in the early 20s if you go out things like that eat well and try as much as you can to live healthy grace you're talking about people having liver cirrhosis not too long after college experience and mm-hmm. that's the excess that we are we are we are hoping to 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 talk about you know it's, yeah, it's avoid about- excesses mm-hmm. yeah avoid excesses and talking of savings think of emergency fund early retirement the best thing i could really advise you is talk to a financial advisor to advise you on how to use your money and most of them are free especially the banks they even beg you can you come in on this day and we talk about your financial planning we did not have such uh, opportunities we didn't even have enough money to to even think about financing yeah then yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that was difficult yeah and then family comes first that would be my number one on the list family mm-hmm. comes first east west family is best mm-hmm. when all is done when your friends have run away when you left on your own homeless sick mm-hmm. 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 your family yeah. will stay with you yeah at There's least a... one member of the family will stay with you there is um is it a methali in kiswahili I, i've seen it rotate come around the internet of mwenda tezi na omo marejeo ni ngamani and uh-huh. the direct translation and is you know, the boat has the front and the back but you always yes. come into the middle and it's kind mm-hmm. of the similar thing east or west home is best no matter yes. what there's always going to be a central point to which you always have to pass through and if you have a solid foundation for grace i know for a lot of people it's family uh, by blood but for some people it's having that whether it's a, a someone very very close that you put close to you is that support system then mm-hmm. those are the people that are important to put close to you you know cuz those are probably the people you'll be leaning upon for mentorship you'll be leaning up, upon for investment ideas you'll be leaning upon to make those initial networks that you know you take with you when you get as you continue to grow older so the yeah. more you know about that and respect and invest time in building those relationships don't mm-hmm. use family if just if you need something take your time yeah. in relationships as well Yeah, don't forget the family when all is well, you're doing well, you're too important to pick those calls. Those calls will take you. Yeah, at the end of the day you will need your family. So build yeah. that family relationship relationship over time. It's yeah. so so important. Yeah. yeah. And uh, great uh, what about travel? A lot of millennials are traveling. Why is it so important to travel? I think that it's important to travel because there's a certain level of ex- you just get exposed. um the same with anything you don't need to travel to america to get exposed um even in kenya i've grown a little bit i see my friends who go on domestic tourism whether they're going to naivasha or going to kisumu or going to mm-hmm. wajir wherever they're going it opens up a new level of understanding that wow people don't live the way i live they don't think the way they think i think but they still mm-hmm. manage to make it work i don't know how they do it but they do So as much as you can and uh, this is where one place where I I really appreciate uh, the 20s in Kenya um you you want to hang out with your peers and some of that uh, short of just spending time drinking or just dancing you can spend some of that money and save up for a trip with your friends um you can save up for cultural experience you can save, save up for a bunch of experiences 
that are not that expensive nowadays traveling if you know there are many multiple tactics of uh, making airfare cheaper making travel cheaper nowadays people have cars people come together grace like you said uh coming together to to save costs um the much you are able to do that and explore before you start getting tied down uh or find a way to do it while even having a full life then absolutely absolutely that's a reason so- to save in your 20s maybe if you're not thinking about if you have the ability to you can also save for a trip you know yeah so traveling is important when you travel you get educated yeah uh, it, it is a test for your resilience you see how much you can take it mm-hmm. is a, a test for your survival skills but above all it is a test in diversity when you have not left your mother's kitchen you always imagine that that's the best food food in the world but it opens up a vast world of opportunity it opens up your mind and after that you stay work you see how other people live you have see how other people suffer you see how other people uh, manage their uh, challenges and you come back and say wow i can make yeah. my, i can do better than this yeah so grace everybody is worried about their issues at the end of the day and we always fall uh, to peer pressure what are your final words about this be gentle on yourself grace like i said be gentle on yourself um you're mm-hmm. doing the best you can um there's always this self consciousness grace always talk about uh, when you're walking down the street you think that people are looking at you most mm-hmm. most of the time people are busy trying to figure out their own thing in their own head so it's mm. that feeling you know sometimes the 20s is as, as a, a decade of great risk a, a decade of great exposure as you're exploring new things you're being a great assertive putting yourself out there um mm. you know it's your right to be there it's your right to make that known in even if people look at you th- then let them look <laughs> you know be gentle on yourself everyone is worried about making their own ends meet at the end of the day uh, don't apologize for 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 being who you are you know it's not the end of the world you'll be fine you'll be really Just fine be you. but above Just... all treat people as you'd have them treat you respect yeah. yeah respect will take you far and a smile grace on a final note One of my self cares for this week was uh Eliot Eliot smile <laughs> Eliot Yeah Kipchoge Kaino smile was analyzed by various media all over the world they said that his smile was a trickery to the brain to make the brain th- <laughs> think that everything was okay hey, Eliot smile I tell you the way he smiled but when he was asked he said his smile was not really a challenge his <laughs> His smile was real just seeing that last final line you know knowing that he had done this made him smile a smile takes you a long way a sulk being bad tempered takes you a very short distance so when mm-hmm. we leave this program tonight thank you viewers for watching us and remember you would smile hey, that El- smile smile <laughs> <El> smile come <laughs> chacha grace come chacha come chacha kweli come chacha come chacha see you in two weeks time come chacha Peace. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>